Welcome to the Concussion Summit. I'm here today with Dr. Michael Drizwicki from the Neurologic Wellness Institute in Woodville, Illinois, and today he's going to speak to us about dysautonomia and concussion. So thank you, Dr. Mike, for being here today. Yep, thanks for having me. Good to see you. So let's get right into it. What is dysautonomia? Yep. So dysautonomia is a it's an umbrella term to describe basically uh, dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system. So uh, certain conditions that fall under that umbrella, you look at hypertension or high blood pressure, hypotension, low blood pressure. Uh, we say tachycardia, which is a high heart rate. Um, POTS, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a syndrome that is common um, where the uh, the patient goes from lying down to standing up and they have a sudden and sustained increase in their heart rate that's that stays it's higher than it should be and stays longer than it should be um, so really any dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system which controls um, some of the automatic functions of your body right so sweat responses pupil uh, diameter heart rate blood pressure um, how blood is moved through your body um, how your uh, your gut or your your gi tract functions um, different glands, things like that, those are all governed by your autonomic system. And when there's dysfunction in those symptoms, typically from a neurological cause, that's what is termed dysautonomia. Okay. And besides from concussions, what else can cause dysautonomia? Um, yeah, so there can be uh, genetic components for certain things. Um, there can be lifestyle things. So if you look at um, significant, you know, we say hypertension or, or, you know, really poor lifestyle choices, uh, you know, if you're smoking, um, drinking heavily, um, eating very poorly, you can have autonomic dysfunction that can lead to um, your, uh, you know, high blood pressure, let's say that could be one of them. Um, you can have different things such as viruses, right? So it's pretty common when someone, you know, there's a, obviously with um, the, the new virus that's around now, uh, there seems to be more and more people with autonomic uh, dysfunction, but then this isn't, that's not something that's brand new. There's, you know, previous viruses um, that people have gotten uh, have, can cause dysautonomia as well. So uh, there's a lot of causes and we look at concussion as a big part of it, right? Head injury can definitely cause uh, autonomic dysfunction just because your main part of your autonomic system is housed or starts in your in your brain and in your brainstem. And so for right from there, why do you think that concussions many times are associated with dysautonomia? And how do you think dysautonomia affects the recovery of someone who might have had a concussion? Yeah, it's good. Uh, and there's a couple of questions there. The the first is you go, okay, well, why why can concussions and, and mild TBIs or concussions as they're termed or, or severe TBIs? You see pretty significant dysautonomia and severe TBI as well. Uh, usually the dysautonomia that's associated with severe TBI can be worse, but, but not necessarily. Um, but let's talk specifically concussions. Um, the the type of damage that happens with concussions, you have the the forces that go through the brain and go through the brainstem when there's a, a hard hit to the head. And those forces cause not damage that can be seen on an MRI, but it they're physiological damage, meaning that they happen at the the cellular level. And with those with the damage that comes from that, the the areas that are most commonly damaged are right down in the the middle part of the brain and where that middle part of the brain is you have your brain stem your your brain stem controls uh almost all of your autonomic uh, or i'm sorry automatic functions in your body one of the primary automatic functions is your autonomic nervous system like I said earlier, the regulating blood pressure, regulating heart rate, regulating breathing mechanisms, um, a, a lot of different things that come from that, that brainstem area. And when there's damage from a head injury um, or repeated head injuries, it can be many small hits to the head uh, or you know pretty significant large hits to the head can cause damage in those areas of the brainstem, which then leads to problems with the uh, autonomic system because of where it's housed. It's just, it's the location of that system starts in that area that is oftentimes damaged in concussions. Okay, and then does everyone have dysautonomia with the concussion? And if no, how would that affect recovery of someone who might have a concussion without dysautonomia versus someone who had a concussion with associated dysautonomia? 
Yeah. So it, and, and the answer, the, the plain answer is no, right? So not everyone who has a concussion has dysautonomia, but what we see commonly, especially what we see uh, in the office is that many times there is autonomic dysfunction with the concussions and there's varying degrees or, or levels of autonomic dysfunction. So some people might have mild autonomic dysfunction where maybe it's only seen in just how their pupils react to light um, versus somebody who has you know, debilitating um, POTS, let's say, like we talked about earlier, where they have significant brain fog and fatigue and um, inability to stand up without feeling very lightheaded or getting nauseous. So there's varying degrees um, to dysautonomia with concussions. And it's not everybody, but I, I, it's been pretty common with what we've seen. And your your second question of how, how does it change recovery or, or you know, how does it affect your recovery? The, uh, the biggest thing that you can do just with any tissue, your, your brain, of course, is to deliver proper blood flow and proper oxygen and nutrients to the tissue to uh, to heal it. That's the, the how healing works. That's the best thing you can do to heal tissue. And with dysautonomia, oftentimes there's a decreased blood flow to the brain, right? So the, the technical term being decreased cerebral perfusion, basically means your your brain is not receiving the proper amount of blood that it should. And it makes it very difficult to heal the brain and especially long-term concussions. So, you know, people with post-concussion syndrome after three months of dealing with their symptoms is it's termed post-concussion. Um, if you're not able to ship or to move the blood to the brain adequately, then it becomes harder and harder to heal it because the brain is not getting the proper amount of oxygen, blood flow, nutrients that it should. And what kind of symptoms might I have if I have dysautonomia? Yeah, the big ones, you look at brain fog, uh, lightheadedness, fatigue, um, especially you, you look at even some gut issues, right? So a lot of people who deal with um, dysautonomia, the same way that they're maybe not sending blood or getting blood sent to their brain adequately, it may not be sent to the gut appropriately too because of how the autonomic, autonomic system works. When someone goes into the full, they say, you know, sympathetic overload or fight or flight is the easier way to, to talk about it. Blood moves away from your brain and away from your, your stomach and your gut and moves to your skeletal muscles. So a lot of times people have gut issues with dysautonomia. They have a very high heart rate. They have sweating responses where their hands and their feet sweat, um, but might feel very cold. So they get cold hands, cold feet, even a cold nose, cold ears, but their hands are, and feet are sweating all the time. Um, like I said, brain fog is a big one. Confusion even, right? People get confused, their memory starts to go down, they go, I'm, I'm kind of lost, I can't think correctly. And a lot of that can, can be because of different uh, autonomic issues and not moving blood appropriately to their head. Okay, and then as far as therapy out there, what kind of therapies are out there that people are doing? And what therapies do you do in your clinic that might be similar to what other people do? And what therapies might be different than other people do? Sure, yeah. Um, the As far as trying to treat uh, general autonomic dysfunction, uh, a lot of times people, when you look at um, standard, anxiety is pretty high typically with dysautonomia. And so many times anti-anxiety medication is prescribed to, to people to try to help calm down that, that fight or flight mode and, and can be beneficial for some people. Um, sometimes it's not, it doesn't fix the problem necessarily. Sometimes it, it helps with some symptoms. Um, so that that's one. Um, there's vagus nerve stimulation that is being done um, you know, around the around the country, around the world. There, the vagus nerve is a it's a, a major nerve in your body that goes kind of to many different areas. But it, it is the opposite of that fight or flight mode. It is works in that rest and digest mode or or the parasympathetic nervous system, and so that's why people try to stimulate that vagus nerve is to really calm down the fight or flight mode. We do things like that in, in our office as well. Um, we do it through various things. Um, a lot of it is looking very specifically at breathing exercises and other ways of stimulating the lower brainstem through things, let's say, as gargling, humming, um, even some different eye movements can, can be helpful for that um, to try to help stimulate the, the vagus nerve. Um, the other thing that we look at too is a um, modified uh, tilt table treatment 
um, for people with POTS. And there are some people, you look at a, a tilt table test is pretty common to diagnose uh, POTS. And it, it's a very good test. Uh, typically there's a sweat test that goes along with that. We do a similar type thing in the office where we're tilting the patient, but doing it from a therapeutic standpoint as compared to a just a testing or diagnostic standpoint. So basically regulating someone's ability to control their heart rate um, through this, this tilting activity exercise, almost like sort of like doing push-ups for the uh, the autonomic system, right? So there's things that we do from that standpoint. There's also other things almost like, um, like biofeedback type things where you can have somebody listen to their own heart rate while they're doing breathing exercises to figure out how they can calm down their own heart rate and calm down their own blood pressure through some of these internal networks uh, that they have in their brain. So there's a, there's a lot of various things that we do in the office, but it's really specific to each person. Um, they, when each person comes in, <clears throat> they go through an extensive exam. We really look at the autonomic system closely and try to figure out where the errors might be and what type of dysautonomia they're dealing with, and then try to affect the different parts of the brain through physical type therapy or brain therapy, neuro, neuro rehab therapies, to try to bring them out of that fight or flight mode and try to activate the rest and digest system uh, more appropriately. Perfect. And I know people sometimes with dysautonomia search out hyperbaric oxygen chambers. What has been yep. your experience with the hyperbaric oxygen chamber in your clinic and patients who do have dysautonomia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's a good question too. So we do have the hyperbaric chamber and um, like we talked about earlier, the the difficulty with trying to treat somebody with dysautonomia, <clears throat> especially with POTS, when when they as soon as they stand up, they can't give the amount of blood to their brain like they should. It's a it's a blood flow and nutrient delivery problem. One of the the primary things being oxygen delivery. If you can't get oxygen to your brain appropriately, then it's very hard to heal it. So what we do with the hyperbaric chamber, we get patients in in hyperbaric oxygen, and what that does is it. it creates a pressurized uh, environment for them where it pressurizes their body as well as pressurizing the uh, oxygen that's in that's being pumped into the chamber and that allows uh, a, a direct access to of to the cells of oxygen so that we can deliver as much oxygen as possible where there might be instances um, where the autonomic system is not doing an adequate job of delivering the blood through the normal means which is you know, going through your your lungs and breathing and getting into the bloodstream and then moving it to the tissues. If that's not working so well because that system is broken, uh, we'll say, then we can use the hyperbaric chamber to try to force the oxygen to those tissues to help it heal uh, absent of, of blood flow issues. How common do you see dysautonomia in practice? Or if you had to take a guess, what percentage of patients do you think have dysautonomia of the patients you see every day? Yeah, that's good. Um, like I said, there's varying degrees of dysautonomia. So as, as far as the number of people that have some sort of dysautonomia, uh, I, I would say the percentage is pretty high. Um, we, we see just in general, we see a lot of dysautonomia. Um, some degree of it, I would say those percentages are pretty high. Most people have something that is going on. Um, like I said, it can be as simple as just abnormal pupil responses or, or blood pressure that's a little bit erratic. As far as diagnosable dysautonomia, um, where it's, you know, it's a true, let's say POTS or hypoten orthostatic hypotension, hypertension, it, it, for our office, for our facility, it's still pretty high, I think probably in comparison to, to most places. Um, like for example, we were seeing a lot of POTS. POTS was a, a normal thing for us to see. Gosh, I don't know, probably percentages looking at, I don't know, 50 to, maybe 50 to plus percent of people coming in with a primary autonomic issue um, or dysautonomia type thing for the patients that I'm seeing. And, and like I said, there can be varying things that cause that, but but just looking at the dysautonomia side of it, pretty high percentage, if, if not more. Um, but we were seeing a lot of that before even um, the pandemic happened. And then all of a sudden, because of how this virus is acting with the with the system, there's a lot of autonomic issues. And suddenly you hear a lot of things on social media and, and standard media and just rumblings all, the, all of a sudden of, you know, POTS and what is POTS and what is dysautonomia. And, and, and it's um, it's one of those things that's unfortunate because, you know, there's a lot of people that are dealing with these things now. Um, but we were seeing that stuff long, long before it got sort of 
I'll say popularized by the effects of the pandemic even. So it, it's pretty common, I would say. And when it comes to treatment, what would make the treatment at your clinic any different than treatment at any other clinic? Well, one thing that's that's straight away, we uh, we don't use medication at all. So there's there's no medication, there's no pharmaceuticals. Um, not to say, you know, there's patients that come in and they, we co-manage them with other doctors where they're currently on medication um, or they we're recognizing that they need to, to go to somebody for a medication uh, for a short term type thing while they're being treated. But we don't do any use any pharmaceuticals in our office. Um, the difference really we look at the, the brain and rehabbing the brain through physical means. Right. So everything that we have to do, we have to have an effect on the nervous system through a physical process. And most of that looks like neurological rehab. Right. So there's um, different uh, like I said, I, I talked about that tilt table that we do. There's different electrical stim to various parts of the, the nervous system, the body uh, that can have an effect on, on these things. Um, there is different eye movements that we do to try to help calibrate the vestibular system and even coordinate the cerebellum, which plays a role in, uh, in the autonomic uh, nervous system as well. So really the biggest difference is looking at how we can treat the autonomic system through physical means as compared to pharmaceutical means. And of course, we look at other things where um, the standard recommendations, let's say for people with POTS of drinking adequate water, increased salt intake. Um, we look at dietary things and, and general uh, inflammatory problems that might be going on. So we kind of look at, at many different avenues, um, but the biggest difference is that there's no pharmaceuticals that are used. Okay, well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanna add before we finish up? No, I think we covered a lot of it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you, you too.